గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ అండ్ వెల్కమ్ టు గన్ అట్ షార్ట్ సస్ట్రకాల్ వనకం అండ్ జై హింద్ టుడే వీ గోన్ టు డూ అ రివ్యూ ఆఫ్ చైనాస్ ఫాల్టరింగ్ ఎకానమీ అండ్ టు క్యారీ అవుట్ దిస్ రివ్యూ వీ హ్యావ్ విత్ దస్ డాక్టర్ క్రిస్టీనా చెన్ ఫ్రమ్ ఐఎన్ డిఎస్ఆర్ తైవాన్ సో ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ అస్ ఐ లైక్ టు ఫస్ట్ వెల్కమ్ డాక్టర్ క్రిస్టీనా వన్స్ అగైన్ ఆన్ గన్ అట్ షార్ట్ madam thanks a lot for joining in from taiwan it's an honor that you are able to join in with us um good evening general um shangra thank you for asking me again to uh be here and and um you know good good evening to all of you right uh we all know you know that the chinese economy has been you know faltering and uh, they've been hitting new lows every day high unemployment and you know the manufacturing is down exports are down imports are down um and a lot of internal issues a lot of layoffs salary cuts everything uh, we've been tracking this quite uh, keenly within india and i've been writing on it and i've been speaking on it also but then we have one view okay and uh, there's a requirement for us to understand your view because taiwan and china have uh, greater equations with each other yeah. and you're more connected you're mm-hmm. more connected uh, economically also than you know um, than china with than india and uh, you know china and a lot of your businesses are invested in china which yes. is not the case with us right uh and now with this faltering economy uh, there are issues uh, you know with uh, the political side of it also and unless you understand this uh, faltering economy we will not be able to you know navigate the problems ahead with china and what's more uh, the problem with china is that this faltering economy might force china and xi jinping to externalize and to some extent they've already done the first shot of that by issuing out a new standard map yeah which takes in a lot of other territory and rights and the south china sea and the nine dash line has become a 10 dash line all of a sudden yes so there are issues so if this faltering economy continues for some more time we're going to have repercussions mm-hmm. and so this all this in mind i thought you know we welcome you and uh, uh, give us an idea and then we'll discuss okay is it going to recover not going to recover what are the after effects of all this we'll do that but first your presentation and it's all yours take it on all right thank you um so um i um thank you general and um yes as you uh, pointed out that um um we i think everyone has been uh, following um this um uh, issue about the uh, chinese economic development uh, very closely because china is a huge country and it is a uh, a big player you know and um so its economy will definitely have um an uh, impact on global economy and um even global security and um you correctly pointed out that right now i think um there's no doubt that um as of now the chinese economy is not doing well it is faltering and um many analysts have already pointed out um that and um some even began to kind of speculate about the uh future of chinese economy wondering if uh, the chinese economy will have this long term you know recession will experience this long term stagnation some even wonder if it's going to be um following in japan's footstep um you know remember in the 19 um in the 1990s japan um experience so um um so i'm going to just to add uh to that discussion um with a little of my um own point of view so um just to begin and um could you uh turn on the the presentation yes uh, next slide please i think um it is no doubt as i said um it is no doubt that currently the chinese um economy is faltering and this is somewhat um unexpected uh for many people because many people uh, thought that 
Yes, I mean, because uh, we were in this global pandemic for um, almost three years, three years or so. You know, we've been in this um, situation for uh, a, a while. And that definitely had negative impact on global economy. China, no doubt, was uh, part of that. And um, so people uh, felt that as um, China kind of a uh, 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 Chinese uh, the pandemic ended, um, we will be seeing the Chinese economy to uh, have this rebound. So that was the expectation. However, um, you know, after um, China, after the white paper movement, um, Chinese authorities announced this uh, lift of the zero COVID policy. So that kind of marked the end of China's very strict um, control over um, the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, according to the data, it showed slight improvement, slight rebound. But um, as you can tell from these uh, GDP um, growth um, data, yeah, I mean, um, overall, we're seeing the, uh, the GDP growth kind of faltering. So this is a, a graph that shows the trend of GDP um, growth from 2020 to 2023, we see that, I mean, um, in the initial stage of the COVID pandemic, uh, the Chinese economy had this somewhat of a, a slight spike um, in, um, I guess, quarter two of 2020. And that uh, reflected, um, you know, the, the rest of the world uh, was you know, hit by the, the pandemic, while China was like, you know, it, it was like the first country um, so um, it kind of um, had that spike. But then after that spike, we saw this decline and um, this overall decline. And um, in um, the most recent quarter of 2023, we see that you know, the economic, the GDP growth has really gone up. So that you know, shows, um, just based on this, um, you know, this data, it shows that the uh, Chinese economy is faltering, it's not doing well. And um, some people even believe that uh, because you know, in uh, the uh, previous two sessions, the Chinese government, um, the premier um, announced that, um, that they announced this target of 5% GDP growth for the rest of the year, which was considered very modest. But um, um, I think uh, most, uh, many people, I wouldn't say most, but many people began to uh, believe that um, the uh, for the rest of the year, the GDP growth would not um, exceed five percent. Um, next, please. So, just a little, um, you know, um, indicators uh, showing that while the overall um, GDP growth um, is not improving, um, if we look at you no know, more specific measures, um, some some of the not so-called drivers or the um, pillars of Chinese economic growth. We see those indicators also um, showing this faltering trend. If we look at exports, we see that exports, yes, um, the, the, the black dash line stands for 2023. So on the right-hand side of 2020, uh, the, the, the black dash line stands for the, the uh, trend after 2023. So uh, we see that export also you know, um, showing this decline. And um, that, that suggests that uh, you know, global, you know, on the global scale, the demand um, has weakened. So, um, so even after COVID, um, the global demand for exports, for Chinese exports, hasn't really uh, picked up yet. And um, not to mention the domestic um, Chinese economy situation. So, so exports, um, we see this decline, is, hasn't really uh, gone up. We will see uh, CPI, the Consumer Price Index, also showing this decline. And CPI is um, is a indicator for you know, consumer confidence. So that says uh, something about the uh, Chinese um, uh, people. You know, they they don't feel confident um, even after uh, COVID, uh, and this happened. You know, um, during the uh, that 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 dip. Um, occurred uh, when the uh, Chinese authorities um, engaged in very strict lock lockdowns. Well, notably, the uh, the lockdown happened um, in Shanghai, the two months lockdown. So uh, that reflected this uh, low uh, consumer confidence in the Chinese market. You know, they were not confident, so they were not you know pulling out the money from their pockets to to buy things. 
that's the CPI. And then um, something that uh, I think General also pointed out earlier that youth unemployment, something that is very, very serious, um, a serious issue in um, China today, uh, something that uh, has been um, bugging the Chinese government, the CCP for you know, um, you know, now. And um, the latest um, uh, stat says that youth unemployment had, um, has surpassed 20%. So it reached like around 21%. And that is the official uh, statistics. So 21% uh, was uh, the, the um, data reported by the official the authorities. There's a, a, a university professor in China, I think he's from Beida, and he um, um, calculated um, the youth unemployment. He said the real youth unemployment um, is about double uh, of 21%. So it's a, a around 46. According to his calculation, the youth unemployment rate um, is about 46%. You know, that is... That's extremely high, so um, you know it's so um, severe uh, to the point that you know the uh, the Chinese authorities uh, announced that they will no longer release the data on youth unemployment. So they just uh, suspended the uh, publication of such um, figures. So uh, and then that that also is an indication that they know that it's so uh, serious. Uh, that they, they, they you know refuse to 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 show the the situation to uh, the outside world. Uh, when we look at new loans, um, it, it shows this this dip after 2023. Also, indication that um, the uh, people in China are um, not borrowing; they're they're um, kind of conservative now. And then um, yuan, when we look at the Chinese currency, it's uh, weakened. Uh, uh, versus the the U.S. dollar, so showing that again, you know, low confidence uh, uh, in the Chinese market. Um, so, you know, those indicators: exports, CPI, unemployment, new loans, and the Chinese currency. They are all they all look not not so good. You know, they all look that that um, supports the the previous graph, which is that overall the economy is uh, faltering. It's not improving. And some people uh, believe that it's it's not going to improve in the near future. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, so why is um, this economic stagnation um, happening? I mean, why, um, despite the expectation that um, we're going to see a rebound in the Chinese economic performance after COVID, uh, we instead we see the uh, reverse trend happening and um, there's a couple of um, uh, factors couple of um, uh, reasons um, that i gather from the uh, uh, current analyses one is that it's uh, about structure you know it's something that um, china um, will definitely um, you know um, encountered um, due to uh, its developmental status so this is the uh, the so-called middle income trap, saying that, and it's an economic theory, saying that you know China is a developing country, and as a developing country, if you, uh, usually the developing countries uh, will pursue this export-oriented, um, low, you know, focusing on the labor-intensive manufacturing path, and China is no no exception. So China adopted this you know strategy of export-oriented focusing on the um, um, labor intensive manufacturing. And that helped China to, you know, um, its GDP to grow at a rapid pace. But um, as it developed, um, its income um, increased and um, it reached this you know, middle income status. And then its growth potential has decreased as a result. So um, instead of having another so-called you know, technological breakthrough or innovate, innovation um, capacity breakthrough, China, um, this developing country, will have a hard time going from the so-called middle income to high income status. So if China wants to um, be like the United States, um, some countries in EU or um, Japan, 
it will have to um, experience that so-called innovation capacity growth. Otherwise, it will be stuck in this middle income trap. And there are some signs saying that um, the, uh, China, uh, the Chinese economy has already kind of um, strained and has grown out of that um, um, this uh, path. So the path is no longer sustainable. So that's the so-called you know, middle income trap or something that um, some econ economists will come in and say, well, this is not a surprise because China, you know, the, eventually it will you know, uh, meet, uh, encounter this uh, stage and therefore the economic stagnation. But um, I think there's also um, other explanations. Um, some of them are more political oriented. Uh, one is, um, you know, has to do with China's um, economic system. And um, some political economists um, would describe China's political system as a state, political economy as state capitalist system. After all, China, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the CCP um, um, has a strong control over the Chinese economy. Yes, China has experienced, uh, you know, rapid growth due to the market reform and opening. So, you know, during the 1980s and 1990s, um, under Deng Xiaoping and its successors, China, uh, you know, opened its door to, uh, you know, foreign countries, invited um, FDI, foreign di direct investments. You know, it, it kind of um, adopted partial liberalization to its market um, economy. So um, that did happen, but, um, you know, if you look at the history of that um, China's economic development, you see that these state-owned enterprises they never disappear. You know, they 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 remain an important player in the Chinese economy. And yes, um, during the 1990s, um, the CCP tried to privatize the SOEs. So there's a wave of um, privatization. But um, after 2000s, um, we see that the CCP, you know, focusing or, you know, turning up its focus on the state-owned enterprises. So SOEs, um, they kind of, uh, they're always there and they continue to grow in strength and in influence. And that in turn kind of squeezed the uh, private sector space. And in China, the private sector, even though the private sector is important because um, they contribute to the economic growth and um, mostly they contribute to a lot of the jobs that are you know, missing uh, nowadays and you know, that explain the, uh, the high unemployment. So private sector is important and it used to be vibrant, but um, when it comes to you know, comparing the private sector to the SOEs, the private sector in China, they never um, um, have an equal footing versus the SOE. So in other words, I'm saying that the state-owned enterprises in China, they, they are privileged, you know, because of their status, because of their relationship with the government. Um, they, they get, you know, um, subsidies, they get funding, they get privileged policy, um, uh, favorable policies. So um, the SOE, some of them um, became um, champions. Uh, they, they were quite successful. But most times, I mean, the nature of the SOEs are such that um, they um, tend to be um, overproductive or you know, they're not that profitable. You know? so, so that's the nature of the SOE. So um, if you look at China's e economic system, it remains state capitalist. Um, so um, that you know, um, ex partially explain why we're seeing economic stagnation because um, China's um, economy never fully liberalized. You know, the uh, state-owned enterprises the party state remain influential and they have become more and more influential. For example, the, um, the uh, uh, CCP is pushing for the establishment of the so-called grassroots party organizations in the enterprises, private enterprises. So I'm, we're not talking about the state-owned enterprises having those party organizations. We're talking about private enterprises being asked to have party organizations and party cadres in their companies. And um, those, um, some of them are you know, foreign owned enterprises. So um, that, that, that says again, something about the, uh, the 
uh, nature of the Chinese economic system. It's state capitalist, and um, the, the party state remains strong, has a lot of say over the uh, market activities. So I think that also partially explain why we see economic stagnation because state or enterprises, they can be successful, but you know, after all, they tend to be you know, less productive and um, um, kind of wasteful. So um, that's one thing. And then um, the, the um, and I, I would use the semiconductor industry as an example to illustrate that you know, under the Chinese state capitalist system, um, uh, we can see some success, uh, but overall it can lead to this economic stagnation. So a little word about the semiconductor industry. Um, since Xi Jinping took office, um, the CCP has um, emphasized a lot on developing um, China's own semiconductor industry. Um, they're very ambitious. I mean, as early as the uh, upcoming of the Made in China 2025. So in 2015, um, the CCP came up with this Made in China 2025 initiative, and in that they already show, you know, their ambition to make China. They want to make China, you know, technologically semiconductor-wise self-sufficient. So they declare this goal, you know, that they want to achieve 70% of semiconductor self-sufficiency um, by 2025, something like that. And um, in order to achieve this goal, the CCP, the Chinese party state, um, invested a lot in helping, in trying to foster the semiconductor industry in China. So they uh, had this so-called big fund, uh, big funds, and they, uh, they, they came into two stages. These are a massive amount of investment, massive amount of money pour into the semiconductor industry and the related companies in China. However, the big funds, um, as uh, massive as they, they were, um, they turned out to be uh, kind of wasteful. They're not that uh, successful. And um, in fact, um, the, um, um, in recent years, uh, there are news about the uh, semiconductor uh, top executive from some semiconductor firms in China and some uh, officials, they uh, were uh, you know, arrested and charged for corruption. So that is indication that you know, when it comes to um, strategic industry, something that you know, is definitely state capitalist because the CCP would you know, um, have a uh, um, um, direction and um, oversight over these um, developments, these so-called strategic industries. So. Um, they, they, they try to foster the semiconductor industry in China, try to make it self-sufficient. But they, they're, the ways they've done so um, led to a lot of waste and did not yield success. So um, I think that had to do with this um, state capitalist system and the, the ways the, um, the Chinese um, Communist Party allocated the resources. I mean, government, um, you know, they, as, as hard as they try, it, is very difficult for a government, you know, non-experts to really know what market needs, what market wants. So if you're a government and you try to kind of play um, the, the role of the business, of the market players, then, you know, it usually ended up, you know, um, not successful. And it could contribute to economic stagnation. And that's, um, uh, uh, I think the political economic explanation, when it comes to the political side of the explanation, I think it has to do with Xi Jinping and the uh, the CCP regime. The the uh, you know the, the the CCP regime nowadays has become such that um, you know it's really closed off. And um, Xi Jinping, um, ever since he came to office, he has been increasingly emphasizing security. I mean, we look at the 20 party Congress report, the term security was mentioned um, so many times and he linked security to almost every aspects of Chinese economy and society. So economic security, you know, social security, technological security, everything has to do with uh, the Chinese national security. So that, that reflects this mentality of Xi Jinping and the uh, CCP that they're so insecure about you know uh, the regime, they're so worried about the regime um, survival 
that they, they, they talk a lot about, you know, security. And uh, because of that overemphasis on security, economic growth uh, became secondary, you know, because security was the top priority for the CCP now. They were willing to, you um, know, I think they regret it now, but, you know, still, um, if you look at their priority, um, they focused on security. And economic growth, they say, well, you know, we no longer want rapid economic growth like used to be. We, we want so-called high quality growth. I mean, that's, that's just saying that they, they, they recognize that it's difficult to return to the, you know, the golden age, the you know, reform and opening period, when you see this more than 10% um, GDP growth. They realize that it's very difficult for them to kind of um, um, return to that situation. And um, Xi Jinping, you know, his uh, policy decisions and uh, his leadership style also led to this economic stagnation. You know, if we look at the, um, his insistence on uh, zero COVID policy, I mean, zero COVID was kind of successful in the initial stage of the pandemic. But as um, the pandemic situation shifted, as the, very, the popular um, strain um, shifted to Omicron, um, you know, that, that, that strategy was no longer that, um, that useful and that helpful. So um, Xi Jinping, he nevertheless, he insisted on, you know, lockdowns, very strict measures, and that caused, you know, a lot of, you know, um, foreign um, investors to lose confidence in um, China. And, um, you know, even a lot of, you know, uh, people in China, you know, began to be, uh, become disillusioned with the CCP. They, they felt, you know, the lockdown experience was such that that made uh, people in China um, not, you know, um, really, really hopeful. And um, they felt, you know, the, the party has gone too much. So um, this insistence on zero COVID that reflects Xi Jinping's leadership style and how he made his policy decisions. And that in turn contributed to the economic stagnation. Last but not, last but not least, I mean, I think um, this is um, something um, we've um, heard of that, you know, Xi Jinping or the CCP, um, even though nowadays they kept talking about, you know, private sector development is very important. We want to foster private sector economic growth but I don't think the private sector has faith. You know, it, it, it no longer has faith, confidence in the Chinese environment because um, of the experience that, you know, the, the CCP conducted very serious, very heavy crackdowns on the private sector industries, such as housing, private tutoring, you know, um, Alibaba, those high tech. Um, these were used to be very vibrant and very you know, influential. But the CCP under Xi Jinping, you know, engaged this very top, um, very serious crackdown on those industries, and that definitely, um, you know, stemmed the private sector growth, and made the private sector players losing confidence in uh, China. They they felt, you know, the invest but investment climate in China is no longer predictable. There's a lot of unpredictability inside China, so um, the uh, investors. The market players or the economic players, they, they, even the consumers themselves, no longer have confidence in the Chinese market. Next, please. So um, with that said, um, well, we see General Shankar correctly pointed out um, that um, the, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, policy moves made by the CCP. So um, some examples include, um, <clears throat> excuse me, because we talked about the, um, the housing market and the housing market, it's very important because it's really the engines of China's um, you know, growth. A lot of local authorities, a lot of local governments, they relied on the um, real estate for their revenue. And um, because the real estate um, hasn't you know really improved the situation hasn't improved so the uh, we're seeing the Chinese government trying really hard to um, kind of revive the um, housing market so some of the uh, measures that came, they came up with or they proposed is um, things like preparing to cut the interest rates on the existing mortgages 
So um, the largest banks in China are preparing to cut interest, interest rates. On most 38.6 trillion yuan on the, of the existing mortgages. Another proposal is that local governments could scrap a rule that disqualifies people who have ever had a mortgage, even if fully repaid, repaid from being considered the first time home buyer in major cities. So they're trying to come up with a way to encourage um, people to buy, you know, so they try to lower the qualification for the, um, the uh, first home buyer. Also, um, there's a, um, a, a policy um, that um, would extend loan relief for the developers. So um, uh, they want the developers to be able to kind of uh, finish building the, uh, the, the housing, housings, because I mean, nowadays there's a lot of unfinished um, housing in China. So a lot of the uh, people who um, have made the deposits, who wanted to move into their new apartment, they found out the apartments are half built, you know, not finished. Um, um, so this measure was um, aiming at this, trying to encourage the developers um, to finish the uh, building of the housing. And um, last, but, last but not least, you know, um, the bank also um, proposed to lower the rates on existing mortgages. The second um, measure had to do with interest rate itself. So there's a proposal to, um, to have a 50, 15 basis point cut um, on the um, interest rate. And then in the financial markets, we also see some measures like you know, lower stamp duty on stock trades, escalate the defense of the Chinese yuan, um, try to make the Chinese yuan stronger. On the consumer goods side, there's also a proposal to increase the manufacturing of small consumer goods. Private business were also encouraged to, um, you know, increase the activity. So there's a proposal to uh, crack down on government malpractices. Dealing with private business, pledge to boost credit to private companies and extend other funding measures to small firms, encouraging private firms to invest in key industries. So all in all, I think um, this shows that the uh, Chinese um, government is trying really hard. You know, they, they, they kind of try to mobilize different um, agencies, different government, uh, different bureaucracies to come up, come up with ways to encourage um, consumers, encourage um, housing market to revive, and to um, encourage private business to resume activities, encourage investments. But I think um, these measures, they, will not be that successful because uh, the, the, the key is that the economic stagnation, it had its root in the, you know, the, it's, it's systematic, it's structural. Um, so uh, without really, you know, um, going to the root, which is if you want to revive the economy, um, most people said that you should just, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, let go of the control let go of the regulations, you know, instead of cracking down on these private sectors, you should, you know, lift those restrictions. And instead of, you know, having a very harsh policy or, you know, asking these private enterprises to accept party um, organization, you should just remove those restrictions and, you know, let the, the private um, sector, that the economy, that the market to do their things. You know, don't put too much regulations. Don't put too much control on these. But um, right now, um, for based on the measures that we've seen so far, we're not seeing the CCP letting go of its control. You know, re removing its control on the economy. We're seeing that they're they're, they're still maintaining that very um, tight control, tight oversight over the economy. So those measures are just, you know, um, scratching the surface. They, they won't really solve the um, problem, which is that, as I said, I think in China, the consumers, the investors, you know, domestic investors or foreign investors, you know, they, they don't have confidence in um, the, the market. They don't have confidence, you know, um, I think more precisely, they don't have confidence in the CCP. They think that the CCP is going to be this unpredictable um, government, you know, if they want to um, achieve some political objectives, they will, you know, pass um, some policy, regardless of the impact 
on economic activity and performance. So from these investors or from these consumers' point of view, because the government is such way, you know, that political priorities override economic priorities, then, you know, with in, if you can't really remove that doubt, that, um, that, that, that sense of doubt from the, um, the uh, economic uh, actors, then you can't really revive the uh, economy. You can't really bring China out of that economic stagnation. Next, please. So um, this is my last slide, and I would like to um, um, give some of um, my uh, views on the impacts of this economic stagnation. So I think, I think that um, um, even though the CCP tried to come up with different policy measures to salvage the economy, I don't think given uh, the, the policies now, the economy will be revived in the near term. So what's the implication? I think there's going to be some implications Domestically speaking, I think it will lead to rising domestic challenges. We talked about, you know, um, the youth unemployment surpassing official stat is um, more than 20 percent. Reality may be more, much more. So, um, you know, those kind of social economic challenges are there. And um, if it, the economic uh, um, situation remains such way, it will uh, get worse. And then... Um, um, we will see because, you know, without having the economic growth as a tool to, um, to get people happy, you know, then in order for the party to maintain control, maintain so-called regime stability, regime survival, we're likely to see the CCP relying more and more on repression and um, nationalism. Know, ideology to maintain control because they no longer have this economic growth as a way to you know to buy people's consent to buy people's um, you know permission agreement to kind of be controlled by the CCP so we would likely to see more um, repression and more nationalism for example um, lately the uh, CCP has passed this anti-espionage law which has huge impact because um, foreign investors, foreign business, researchers, scholars, journalists, I mean, people from outside, they will, um, after the uh, passing of this law, um, people from outside will be very scared about visiting China, about doing business in China or engaging in you know, different kinds of activities with Chinese. And even the Chinese are affected by the anti-espionage law because they, they feel, you know, um, they were mobilized. I mean, there's a latest uh, news article, news story about the government authority encouraging the uh, citizens in China to participate in this anti-espionage effort. You know, they, they, they encourage people to call off, you know, um, each other to kind of um, um, uh, conduct surveillance on their neighbors or on the other people to catch spies. So this would have a huge impact on Chinese society definitely will um, discourage investments, definitely will discourage um, business activity in, uh, inside China. And then another thing uh, we're seeing is this rising trend of nationalism. A latest uh, 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 trend is about this uh, draft law um, from the Public Security um, um, Bureau that prohibits comments, clothing, or symbols that hurt nation's feeling. I mean, this draft law um, has um, caused a lot of controversy, you know, a lot of criticisms uh, in, inside China. You know, um, ordinary Chinese net netizens protested about this. They said this is, you know, arbitrary. What, what constitutes um, hurting nation's feelings? You know, what, what does that mean? You know, it can be interpreted in different ways. Even the uh, legal, uh, legal experts in China come out and say, you know, this is, you know, this is crazy. This is something that it's very arbitrary. It will give the law enforcement bodies a lot of power to, um, you know, pers uh, prosecute um, people. So, um, but I think um, the, uh, the uh, authorities in China 
um, released the draft law shows that you know in today's China, um, the CCP is you know feeling very insecure about their position. So they uh, come up with you know very um, um, you would say um, arbitrary uh, policies or laws uh, because they want to maintain control. So rising domestic challenges uh, because of that. And um, as I mentioned, you know, there's going to be more social economic problems because uh, economic stagnation will continue. And then, um, you know, we're looking at uh, young people. You know, we're talking about youth unemployment, um, but we, um, I don't think we're going to see another so-called white paper movement in the near future, because in China, a lot of young people, um, they, they, we call them the lost youth generation. A lot of them are kind of involuted. Um, they don't. They are not happy. They're definitely not happy about their situation, about you know, not able to find a job. But you know, instead of going out to the street to protest, a lot of these Chinese young people they stay, decided to you know, stay home and be the so-called full-time children of their parents. I mean, they, their parents can still afford, you know, um, giving them money or letting them stay, giving them, providing them food. So there are a lot of full. We see seeing a lot of full-time children um, in China right now, and um, in, a lot of these young people um, they're frustrated, but you know they show this at the same time they show this loss of aspiration and hope. You know, so suicide um, rate in China is is quite high, and uh, it's probably going to increase in the near future. Um, we're also seeing uh, rising inter external challenges. Um, right now, I think um, this um, decoupling uh, process is happening right now. And um, the um, um, expert Ian Johnston, in a comment that he wrote, he said, um, China is building a Berlin Wall to forestall existential challenges because I mean, the mentality of the CCP is such that it feels so insecure um, about its surrounding and it responded by kind of uh, building up a wall. So those um, um, things that we see are, you know, we don't un comprehend them. You know, they, they seem kind of um, paradoxical, you know, um, the anti-espionage law, this nationalism going on, um, but it may be the attempts by the CCP to kind of uh, fortress itself against um, you know, outside challenges. And then um, Xi Jinping, you know, um, lately Xi Jinping has kind of um, not showing up at, you know, important summits, BRICS, G20. And I think the latest news is that Xi Jinping is going to send Han Zhen to uh, represent um, at the uh, UN General Assembly meeting. Um, so, you know, Xi Jinping um, is not showing up. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so that's something, that, that says something about, about the CCP, right? Um, they, they are kind of, you know, at least from the outside, you know, they are kind of um, kind of enclosing the leadership in China is in kind of, you know, enclosing um, himself from the outside world. Maybe he doesn't, he no longer cares. Maybe he's uh, too preoccupied with the troubles at home. So, so he just said, no, forget it. But it does say something about China relationship with um, the other countries. And I think, um, you know, the, uh, the, when it comes to technology, you know, we also, you know, going back to my previous points, yes, China is um, trying really hard to achieve uh, technological self-sufficiency despite um, U.S. Um, export controls. U.S. is, you know, passing a lot of export controls, trying to force China to kind of um, stay behind but the Chinese response is that it's going to, it tries to accelerate this um, uh, self-sufficiency um, route. I, but I personally don't think it's going to succeed. But you know, all these um, examples, I think, show that um, in, in, phase two, um, in response to these existent, uh, rising extent, external challenges, the CCP is kind of um, you know, enclosing itself from the outside world. Yeah, that's my that's my take. Oh, that was very nicely put across, Christina. I must Thank compliment you. you for what you have put across. You put across a wide perspective of why China's economy is faltering. 
you covered ideology which i think is fundamental because uh, you know there's no case in history where a communist system has succeeded financially any yeah. any any take any country right china's success was in losing and up loosening up its communist control it's loosening up it or you know watering down its communist form of government which xi jinping is reversing and he's reversing to the extent like you brought out even putting communist people in private firms which means even the private sector is being controlled by the state yes not only the state owned uh, enterprises soes even the lower smaller uh, systems are the private sector so as a result you are only adding to the inefficiency which you brought out very rightly so that's a very bleak picture which is which you say at going ahead uh, yeah there is an important aspect of demographics which you touched upon but i think as we go along the demographic is going to go worse for the simple reason the working class is reducing the buying power is reducing the older people don't have pension right and you do you're not yes. replacing them with younger people and the older people without pension and the state support don't have buying capacity so the switch from a manufacturing economy to a consumer economy is not going to happen in a hurry and it's only going to worsen so it's actually the picture is a little more bleak then the issue which you brought out about geopolitical i'm 100% in agreement with you all china has achieved in the past you know four to five years is increase geopolitical opponent with, within the world and the latest thing which you brought out which i think is marvelous so china has now two walls the great wall of china and the berlin wall which has shifted to its right so it's going to contend with both these walls and a critical thing which you brought out in my own view which i think i'm sure many people today who are watching this uh, will you know understand it better the issue of the national security law and anti espionage law where everyone is going to suspect each other and when everyone suspect e- suspects each other there's no trust if there's no trust there's no business yes i mean yes. you'll agree with me that you know business goes by trust and economy yeah. is about people you know you don't have people your demographics are changing they don't trust each other you don't have geopolitics so where will business go the structural issues are a later day story and this is overridden by ideology which touches people so that is a huge thing and the last point which i would like to add my own views on this uh, about xi jinping not showing up in the brics economics forum not showing up for g20 altogether yeah. not going for the un meet he is sending i think one of his politburo members i, I don't recall the name and the chances are that he might not go for many other events my own guess is this is something to do this is something which is connected with the fact that there's a major purge which is going on within china mm. and that major purge is started with chin gang being axed and we don't know what's his future he's the foreign minister of a state and a state councilor removed overnight then you have yes. li shangfu who's the defense minister from yes. 29th of august he is not been visible at all then you have the uh, case of the three or four top uh, plrf uh, rocket force generals yes. who have been sacked and they have been replaced by a naval person who probably does not have any you know uh, connection with the rocket forces right and then the deputy commission the, the deputy of the central military commission jung jang yu hua or whatever his name is you know comes out and says that the quality of things which have to come in are not that great so if you connect all the dots i think there are a lot of internal problems and the fact that you know xi jinping showed up from brics directly he dropped into xinjiang and from xinjiang it is rumored that he didn't fly he just went by train and he didn't fly he didn't fly this is the rumor you know we don't know whether it's right or not he, the rumor is that he didn't fly he didn't fly because he didn't want to end up like prigozhin or you know in a air crash and if you go back in history 
you know, uh, uh, General Lin Biao, yes. who also died in an air crash, you know, long yeah. back. He was, he was, uh, he had plotted against Mao and all that. Mm-hmm. So China has a problem. China has a PLA problem, the way I look at it. And if China, the Chinese politics and the, the, the PLA have a problem, there is an issue. And the way the leadership has been purged, and this purge is not only for the, the political leadership, even that's extended to the banking sector, the finance sector, and many other places. And plus the industry, like you rightly said, the private sector, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, Meituan, the complete educational tech sector, it's all been purged one year back. So with this kind of a purge, I don't know whether they'll ever reverse back. I mean, this is my commentary on what you said. I think you hit the nail on the head. I just added on to it. Thank you. And the thing which I want to ask you, and, you know, and uh, I'll weigh in with my view a little later, is that, do you think China will recover in the near future? And you said you you don't see it happening. So what is the timeline you put on this future? You think it's five years, six years, ten years? Um, and, uh, okay. Um, I, I, I'm quite pessimistic about if, we, if I have to put the timeline on um, China's uh, point of recovery. I think it's going to be very uh, late if it were to recover, um, because I think this is something, you know, it's, it's going to be a vicious cycle. Because, I mean, um, the more um, insecure it feels, this regime feels, the more um, um, measures these uh, very, you know, um, anti-economic um, business um, measures it will um, you know uh, come up um, so we'll, we'll, so that is going to in turn um, lead to less and less trust more and more you know um, his, you know uh, uh, worried uh, within the Chinese uh, public and um, outside so outsiders would you know were so scared that or so discouraged from you know um, going to China and um, our people inside China if they can run they they will run if they can get out of the country, they will. The, for those uh, who um, have no uh, less capability to, um, they, they stay and they, they become less and less hopeful. So I think, I think um, in this kind of um, um, environment, it's going to be very, very hard for um, economic, um, for business to, to, be, you know, to be revived. Right. The next thing is, let me let me hazard a guess at the timelines, and you know you could comment on it. Uh, you know, structurally, China has been declining. I mean, Chinese economy has de- been declining for mainly two reasons. One is the structural part. Yes. Second is the ideological, political, demographic part. Now, the structural economy of more manufacturing and you know real estate and things like that, which is a little unnatural compared to any other international standard, has to restructure into a consumer-driven economy. That is a... And that itself, which has built over the past, say, six to seven years, in my view, even everything else given normal will take another five to six years to revive, to come, to restructure purely from an economic point of view. Right. Now, if you... Add the ideological problems, the demographic problems, and the technological problems, which you rightly said. I mean, if I might di- digress, Chinese technology has failed all over. You know, there's no tech- breakthrough technology they have brought out. I mean, if I may add, you know, they have not even won a Nobel Prize in technology anywhere so far. If you, it's it, right. So add to this. This is only going to add to the structural problems, which have not started also, right? So I don't see their, uh, China getting out of this stagnation. You call it stagnation, you call it slowdown, you call it deflation, you call it recession, at mm-hmm. least for the next six to seven years. That's the minimum. That will take us to about 2030, right? Yeah. So if that be so, and after 2030, it can't recover because of its demographic and declining population. So we are going to contend with a China which is going to be stagnant or barely or recessing constantly or having economic issues 
in which case they're going to be domestic problems you agree with this uh, theory i do i actually do because i mean, i i agree with you that um i mean all these um you know the the factors that you mentioned structural ideological political technological i mean these are you know they they uh, e on, on each of their own is in itself very challenging and you add them together because they they relate to each other they they kind of connected to each other so so that 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 lead to this uh challenge you know almost difficult to be solved you know we to have to put a timeline in you know, 2030 i i agree you know by 2030 i probably don't don't uh, see much improvement given you know what we observe, observed now and um i also would like to add that um you know um I think it, it does have this political, I mean, it also comes to um, the uh, CCP's, um, you know, intention. I mean, because after all, the CCP as a regime, it just wants to stay in power. And Xi Jinping, he would like to stay you know, as long as he can. Um, that's why he doesn't have a successor appointed. So um, so with that said, um, um, I think um, the uh in order to you know for economic growth uh to happen for the economy to be revived they really have to let go they really have to to um stop you know, you know exerting this much control on the economy but i think they are kind of in this dilemma uh for the ccp they can't do that and you know um you you pointed out that this real estate growth which was crucial for uh, for Chinese um, economic development, this is not healthy. It's something that you know. It's not. Um, it, it created a bubble, and so that is why you know they 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 conduct this crackdown in the first place, kind of st stop the bubble from popping, and creating the financial um, meltdown. But um, you know, for more healthy, for sustainable growth in China, that means you know the the party will have to. Um, you know, um, kind of change its strategy, and it all comes back to that the party has to kind of um, stop, you know, having so much control um, in the market and kind of let the market have more say, you know, to kind of what is uh, productive, what is really good for economy. But I don't think currently the party is willing to do that. So as the party, um, as long as the party wants to keep its hands so um, much um, into the market um, business activities, I don't think um, the uh, the economic stagnation problem will be solved soon. Right. I think you made, a, made some great points. Actually, Christina, you actually have spoken my mind. Really? <laughs> you know, I, uh, next week sometime, I'm, I, I'm going to do a program on why Chinese economy will never recover. You know, I did a program sometime back on the irrevocable decline of China. Yes. And I'm going to do one more on why Chinese economy will never recover mm -hmm. uh, hereafter going ahead. And we have to deal with a China which is not going to recover. That's the challenge, you know. Yes. Uh, right. And uh, there are a lot of people who feel that China might recover in X, Y, Z. And they expect the Chinese government to do something. I think you're pretty spot on. To say that they'll not recover, that's my view also. Look, everything can change, but people don't change. That's the fundamental thing. And if you yeah. see Xi Jinping's personality, he's never changed. Oh yeah. He's not yeah, yeah he's not changed. Right? Okay. Now I'll take some questions on on based on the your yeah, this thing, and I'll take some uh, questions which go with your thinking or where you know uh, we get some this thing. First question I'll ask is this. Ask Madam, will the socio-economic challenge lead to close of the communist system and bring in change into China? Um, my view is that um, um, less likely for now, for the um, near future. Um, even though um, uh, the CCP is encountered with rising um, socio-economic challenges, um, we we expect you know some kind of revolution or some kind of you know um, containment style um um protest movement um it is um unlikely to happen in the near term because um 
yeah, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, um, discontent uh, within the Chinese population, for sure. As much as the um, Chinese want to hide, want to kind of uh, you know repress, there's a lot of pe unhappy people in China. But you know, um, I talked about the youth, you know, the young people in China who are the most um, likely to you know uh, step out and you know um, engage in protests. These young people, you know, they are not the you know the uh, same, you know, as their you know uh, uh, predecessors, you know, who participated in the Tiananmen Square uh, movement. Um, these young people, they, they you know, because I think uh, the the upbringing, you know, they're you know in the the product of this one child family, and uh, so they 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 used to have this very privileged you know lifestyle. So they have high aspiration, but then all of a sudden they, they you know, encounter this um, um, situation. And um, I think the common characteristic for this generation, young generation, is that um, you know, instead of being really you know, um, active, you know, they want to do, make some change. They just say, well, you know, um, let's just stay home. Yeah. And, you know, and, and maybe you try to you know, take the public entrance exam, you know, if uh, lucky, then we get, I, I'll become a public servant and, you know, um, or I'll, otherwise I'll just, you know, stay home. And if I'm so um, pissed off about the government, I'll just go on the internet and, you know, type out some, you know, criticisms. But, you know, going out the street, not really. Um, that's one thing. And then um, China is huge. So, um, in order for a you know large scale uh, protest movement to happen, it it's um, it's already really hard itself. And in order for a Tiananmen um, Square like movement to occur, or white paper movement, you need to have um, coalition of um, different groups. So you know you may have the students you know initiating the movement kind of organizing the movement. And you also need to have other parts of the society to participate. And I think another crucial factor, you know, which happened in Tiananmen is, you know, the uh, part of the Chinese Communist Party, the, you know, uh, maybe, a, you know, some officials sympathetic to the movement also joined the movement. You know, recall in Tiananmen, Zhao Ziyang, he was sympathetic. So he, you know, he, he was kind of on the side of the protesters. We haven't seen this in um, white paper, and it's very unlikely uh, for us to see that, you know, this kind of coalition um, between parts of CCP with the uh, mass, with the, the protesters. And I think you need to have that kind of um, a coalition to happen in order for a movement to have real um, um, influence, Thanks. real influence yeah. on the CCP. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. You know, today there's a lack of political opposition and political leadership and political organization. And on the other hand, the Communist Party is far too entrenched. And it has far too leveraged espionage uh, and, you know, monitoring and electronic monitoring. Yes. And it doesn't yes. allow, uh, you know, coalition of any, any kind of opposition. Yeah. So we're going to have a China, that my own view, we're going to have a China which is going to be very surly, very internalized and very troubling internally. And there will be external implications of this, about which we'll see how it uh, goes along. Right. Uh, okay. I'm going to... Kumar Gopalan, good evening. Uh, you know, I'm taking his name up because he's just... Uh, he, he's come through a very happy occasion in his family. His daughter just got married. And we want to congratulate Kumar Gopalan for you know conducting his daughter's marriage very well. All the best to you and your family. Okay, uh, let me see a few more questions. There are. Okay, okay. Let's say this. Uh, how much of a concern is the new seven nanometer chip by Huawei of China? Is China overcoming the technology sanction of United States? Okay, and um, there's some, yes, um, this has raised the eyebrows, and I think U.S. Uh, officials, some of the U.S. Of, um, um, Congress uh, men, uh, members have already expressed concerns, so uh, we're likely to see uh, the U.S. Um, government coming up with more um, sanctions or more controls um, because they're definitely uh, uh, worried about this. But um, there's also speculations 
about the uh, the seven nanometer chips uh, not really developed by Chinese, by Huawei. I think um, th there's a saying that these uh, they use the uh, remaining stock uh, they bought from, um, I think, Samsung or TSMC. So uh, the, the seven nanometer chips that they use are not, you know, developed by themselves. So that's that's, yeah. um, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you uh, completely. Uh, okay, now good to invite Taiwanese to show, hoping India and Taiwan set up a formal relationship. And they also, the next, another related question later on is, how do you increase the defense relationship between India and Taiwan? And the related question is, how much, how much do you think that Taiwan can decouple from China and couple up with India? So these are three questions basically on the uh, India and Taiwanese relationship going ahead. You can answer it holistically. Okay, so um, I think uh, India and Taiwan can um, improve. I mean, we, we, we can do more, you know, trades, you know, economic. I think there's um, already, when it comes to semiconductor, um, some um, investment plans um, in India. And so that's one thing. And um, um, last time, um, I was in a, at a uh, lunch uh, party and um, I encountered a um, Indian lady and she's, um, I think she's a program um, director of um, some, um, I think, exchange program. So um, she talked about, you know, um, in recent years, um, there's uh, more and more um, students from India um, doing, you know, study abroad in Taiwan. So you know, we also uh, welcome uh, more education exchanges. Um, I think that's one thing that ha has already happened and uh, we welcome more. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. And let me just add, um, you know, in India, there's one more consulate of uh, the Taiwanese uh, oh, yeah. government of Taiwan, which has opened at Mumbai. There's one already in China, in, uh, you know, Chennai, where I am. Uh, and just to give a broad view to all the users and to you also, Christina, I met your ambassador in Delhi. I, you know, I'm uh, uh, in touch with him. I'm also in touch with your look, the consulate general in, uh, you know, Chennai. In mm -hmm. fact, on Monday, we're going to have lunch together. Ah, right. Nice. Uh, and uh, uh, because the new uh, gentleman who's come in, so we thought we'll meet up and all that, and uh, we'll see where it goes. And we are doing a, a lot of things which are being done on the India Taiwan, you know, relationship. Yes. And um, it will be unfair on our part to ask Christina to dilate on that. I'll get someone who's actually focused on this to speak to all our, uh, uh, you know, people, but. Let me put this here. The fact that I'm speaking to Christina itself is an indication that our relationship is going ahead. Yes, yes. yes. Right? That's the yeah, that's thing. Right. It, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is, when will Chinese people uprise against CCP, C and PLA and the military become nation different forces instead of uh, CCP, CPC, slave boy and China become democratic? That's what uh, Christina just explained. I don't think uh, this will ever come about, right? So we'll yeah. leave it at that. Uh, ask what the good doctor's opinion on the recent article by China Center for China Studies that portrays communist China as consisting of illegally occupied Tibet, Manchuria, South Mongolia, etc. Okay. Look, Anand, she doesn't know the background, but let me put it. You know, Christina, the, um, uh, you know, China put out this new map, new standard yes. map. So the Chennai Center for China Studies, which is, you know, here, they made a map in which they showed Tibet as Chinese occupied Tibet, Xinjiang as Chinese occupied Turkestan, Mongolia as Inner Mongolia as Chinese occupied Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is an independent state, and also you, they showed Manchuria as a separate state, and just yeah. the balance was part of uh, uh, Han China and the People's Republic of China. Yeah. And in my view, in my view, I mean, I I wish I had the uh, map. I don't have the map to put up. In my view, the remnant part of China is the one China. One China is a very small part of the existing part of China. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you'll agree with this. Uh, I think I mean it's unfair, uh, Anand, to ask her because she's not seen the map, right? And what I'll do is I'll ask her to have a look at the map. I'll send this map to you. Then maybe you can put your views on the comments page later on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, Tintin, please do a show. What needs to be done to move Taiwanese investment from China to India? We'll do that. I I told you. We'll do that. Uh, okay. Uh, Jagdeep Batra, General Sir, if there is, there is stagnation in housing sector, which is 30% of the economy, how can GDP growth be around 5% as stated, sir? That's what Christina stated. It's not going to be 5%. Yeah. If it touches 2 to 3% also, it's going to be it's going to be huge. Your, any views on this, uh, uh, Christina? Is there stagnation in housing sector, which is 30%? I mean... Um... Mm, well, um, I, I would say, um, I, yeah, I don't, I probably uh, can't really um, answer this question. Yeah, we, you actually have answered this question. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you are answered this question because they, they're not going to change the whole thing. So, right? Yeah. Then, yeah. yeah, then he says, thanks for getting experienced professionals like Dr. Chen to give us a viewpoint from close quarters on China. Uh, yeah, we must thank her in, immensely, right? Thank, uh, you. thank you for And that. how much will nationalism work with uh, China survive by drumming up nationalism is a big question. After the economic woes, it really cannot be wished away. Yeah. How much nationalism uh, work? It's um, it's not really working, you know, because we uh, we I pointed out this um, recent draft of the. Uh, uh, hurting the, na- the national feelings uh, that uh, and that led to a lot of um, criticisms. So um, it shows that nationalism does have its limit. But uh, I think uh, for um, the Communist uh, Party, um, they are running out of tools. So um, economic growth, it's really the thing that keeps the party um, going, you know, to get uh, people's support. It used to, you know, be that uh, and, um, they used to have that that tool in hand, but now um, because you know economic stagnation, so they can no longer rely on that. So they're forced to rely on something else. Um, but nationalism does have its limit. It can, you know, succeed in you know getting those so-called little pinks into actions. But you know, the party also have to be aware and you know, be very. Um, cautious about you know ramping up the nationalism because if it you know gets too um you know um out of control we are talking about this uh diversion and aggression you know then the party will be forced to do something to appease the uh domestic you know anger and they might have to be forced to take some actions in so-called you know, maybe taiwan strait or south china sea and i don't think that is what the ccp um, wants to uh, right now. Yeah, I think we've covered much of the thing. Uh, there's a question which I'll take, I, I'll ask you. It's a little out of your, if the Taiwan uh, political, geopolitical scenario. But, yes. But let me ask you, and maybe you could think of it. Uh, ask, does the doctor think IMEC is workable. IMEC is the India Middle East Economic Corridor, which is now coming out as a result of the G20. The corridor starts at Bombay, goes to the Gulf, and goes across the Arabian Peninsula into Haifa and then on to Greece. Right? Uh, have you heard of this or you focus on it? If not, no, uh, this is not my, okay, fine. my no, area. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not. It's not fair to ask her because she's far away from that, this and not focused on it. And look, we, Anand, we, we, we had uh, our ambassador, Gurjit Singh, speaking to us day before yesterday on this. He's very clear. It will work. Don't worry. See, the difference between the IMEC, which is coming up, and the BRI and the CPC is two main things, mm-hmm. and which everyone has to understand because this question will keep coming up. One, the countries in IMEC are all rich countries or well-to-do countries. India, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and uh, on to Greece, right? They're all, they're, none of the countries uh, need finance from outside. Yes. The finance is with us. 
the second thing is all these countries are politically and strategically connected india is a strategic partner of uae uh, and saudi arabia israel okay uh, usa is also a partnership as a partner of all this and then this you have this i2 u uh, to uh, equation it is something like the eastern quad so there is a whole lot of different dynamics which come into this why i am dilating it with christina and viewers christina gets a view as to how this bri and the cpc is being you know contested outside the pacific and this is a huge model if it comes through it might start the break up of the bri in the longer one mm. okay right uh okay right the last comment is from ramesh narayan thanks a lot madam and general sir great video i also think so i think uh, it's great to have young people young researchers coming on gana shot with old people like me you know and giving out fresh ideas and i thought christina was simply great as always uh, personally christina i think you did a fine job and your audio has also come through excellent unlike last time there were there were some bandwidth issues uh, all over so i can put this video out 100% you know in length you. and uh, i look personally forward to your next sub- subject you can take a call we'll you can come time this thing it's been great and wish you and your family the very best if you have thank anything you. final to say please do say so and otherwise we'll close the show thank you thank you for having me on the show Yeah and um, thanks a lot thanks a lot for all the lovely questions which the audience has put up i think you. you put up very good questions right we couldn't take all but we covered the major issues thank you good evening christina have a good night and have a good night to all of you folks who are watching this show thank you and good thank night you. and jai hind thank Bye-bye. you bye 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 bye